Good evening, everyone. My name is Anakshi Sophi, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Asia Society India Center. I'm delighted to see members, patrons, and friends from across the world join us this evening. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Asia Society is a leading educational organization dedicated to building awareness about policy, business, education, and arts from across Asia on a global stage. Inaugurated in 2006 by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, the India Center has hosted over 800 events, establishing itself as an important forum for the discussion of regional and global affairs. Our initiatives include policy roundtables, CEO forums, public lectures, leadership programs, cultural summits, film screenings, and our signature Asia Arts Game Changer Awards, bringing together art collectors, artists, gallerists, and dignitaries from the art world, celebrating and honoring Asian artists. Please do follow our website and social media handles to know more about the awards and other programs from across our 14 global centers. Exactly one year ago, on March 23rd, 2020, India went into a nationwide lockdown. Within a span of a few hours, a country of 1.3 billion people came to a standstill. Understandably, confining such a large mass of people to their homes unearthed several grave challenges, including the displacement of millions of people, impacting their lives and livelihoods. Equally, the year also brought to the fore the important role played by the private sector, civil society groups, and philanthropic foundations in supporting vulnerable communities. As part of our discussion today, we hope to reflect on the learnings from this past last year, lockdown lessons for inclusive development. We've got a great panel this evening to discuss this. Harsh Mandir is a human rights and peace worker, writer, columnist, researcher, and teacher. He currently serves as the director of the New Delhi-based Center for Equity Studies. Vidya Shah is the chairperson and CEO of Adil Gift Foundation. Under her leadership and the support of its parent, the Edelweiss Group, Adil Gift Foundation has grown to become an important platform for strategic philanthropy in India. Shishir Joshi is the founder and chief executive officer of Project Mumbai. In July 2020, the United Nations awarded Project Mumbai with the Social Development Goal Solidarity Action Award 2020 in recognition of its humanitarian contribution in the fight against COVID-19. Our moderator, Neera Nandi, is partner and co-founder of Dasra India. Dastra plays a crucial role in building capacity in the social sector by driving philanthropic and collaborative action to accelerate social change. A bit of housekeeping before we proceed, all those who are joining us on Zoom, please leave your questions in the Q&A box and we welcome your comments in the chat box. For our audiences on Facebook, please drop them in the comment section. And with that, Neera, over to you. Great, thank you, Inakshi, and thank you everyone for attending this. And, and I hope between myself and my esteemed discussants here, we'll make it worth your, your while. So the topic is recalibrating moral paradigms and lessons from the lockdown. Uh, I wanna shift it a bit and, and you know, Ahar Shashir and Vidya, as you just you know, reflect on a bit of the pivot I want us to take. I wonder if it is about recalibrating moral paradigms or actually rewriting, you know, our social contract and social contract with, with whom. Uh, and if each of you could lean into social contracts typically looked at with the government, but what about with civil society? What about with the private sector? And what about actually with, with each of us? So I think rewriting that, but also rewriting because the social contract works when there's equality. And I think what the lockdown highlighted for us is in fact that there are two Indias. And what I'd love, and I think each of you have that, you know, angle is to speak to what are the lessons of lockdown for these two Indias? So one India is you and I, those of privilege that are able to actually attend this webinar and there's a whole other India for whom the lockdown was very different, a very, very different experience. 
And I'd love for my discussants and panelists to lean into that. I'm first going to come to you, Harsh, because I know that you have deep experience in, in how this lockdown affected both Indias. Um, but I was struck with where I'd really love for you to lend your voice. And I was reading this book called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, The Origins of Our Discontents. And I picked it up thinking, oh, there's going to be lots about India in this book, but it was actually all about America. But a lot resonated in that. And I think we often don't see ourselves here in India experiencing um, this kind of two Indias in a very visible way. It became the truth during lockdown. But I was reading something in there called radical empathy. And I thought, who exhibits radical empathy? And really, Harsh, I think you do. And the way she defines this is, Radical empathy is not about you and what you think you would do in a situation you've never been in and perhaps never will. It's the kindred connection from a place of deep knowing that opens your spirit to the pain of another as they perceive it. And so put us in what you've seen and how you've really exemplified radical empathy to help this India really understand the other India. Thank you so much, Nira. And, uh, you know, everything that you said resonated so strongly with me. Uh, I know we have limited time and there's a great deal that I would want to say. Uh, so please cut me short uh, if I ramble on. Uh, you talked about both uh, the moral crisis and a renewed social con contract and I agree with both. Um, what, uh, we talked about the role of the state, uh, but what troubled me much more is, is that we endorsed state action uh, and a set of state actions which I think uh, are virtually going to be genocidal for a generation of very poor people. Uh, when the Prime Minister announced uh, the lockdown, we had just 500 cases uh, recorded across the country and uh, India announced the largest lockdown in, in the world and in human history. Uh, China at its peak had locked down 5% of its population. We locked down 100% of our population. Uh, but in a country where nine, out, um, when the prime minister was speaking to us on television, he said, stay at home. So my mind, I work with homeless people. I said, doesn't he, he remember that there are pe many people who have no homes to stay in? Um, keep social distance. Uh, you know, if I'm 10 people are living in one uh, shanty and 150 people uh, uh, you know, share a common toilet, what social distance are we going to, are you expecting them to keep? And are they going to, as this, as it gets warmer and warmer, you expect 10 people to live for weeks and months in, in that one? And is that going to help them? Uh, and then he said, uh, 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 work from home, which means that you have, you know, a job that is regular and will give you salary even when you uh, don't go to work. Nine out of 10 of our workers are informal workers. Uh, and actually only 15 have identifiable employers. What is going to happen? Um, and then finally, when he made an appeal, when, the, you know, when he, he asked for charity on behalf of, from those employers. Uh, I, as a worker, why should I be dependent on charity and very uncertain charity, which never came. Uh, and, and then he said, wash your hands regularly. But what about the large populations who don't have running water? And if you have to just go to any urban slum and see how people you know, fall over each other to buy a small pot of water, who are you? So he was clearly not speaking to the large mass of the Indian people. He was talking to people like you and me. And it was so obvious. And, and what troubled me was that, and then we, we said, wow, he's keeping us safe. So we'll bang thalis when he tells us, we we'll light candles when we tell us. We didn't have that sense of outrage uh, that I, uh, you know, to take many, many examples when people were flown in from abroad because actually people want to be with their families. What about our migrants? Uh, the students were, you know, standard in quota. Uh, I was wondering, you know, I really was waiting. I was saying that, could I have had one student in quota, just one, who said, 
you know, at this very time, there, there are, you know, lakhs of migrant workers uh, walking the streets uh, for hundreds of kilometers. I refuse to get onto this bus and go to the safety of my home uh, unless you provide uh, uh, the same safety uh, and the same dignity to, to the workers. But we didn't have one voice. Uh, and, 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 and this is as it unfolded. So uh, there is a huge problem with the state. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it, it's made it very clear that there's some lives that need to be protected, like yours and mine. And there are a large number of lives which don't matter. Uh, and uh, Arundhati Roy somewhere said, in, in fact, in a conversation with us, said that uh, COVID-19 was a virus uh, which we all know, but she said it was also an X-ray. It's an X-ray that revealed who we are as a people. And let us have the courage at least now to look at what we revealed ourselves as a people, how comfortable we remain, assuming that we were being kept safe by our government and indifferent completely that, uh, that millions of our people were uh, being thrown to the winds. Uh, the economic crisis that the contraction, we've never seen this kind of contraction. I don't think people even know what it means. You know, micro, small, medium enterprises, for instance, most of them have shut down uh, and the government has no plan for their revival. These are not impossible things. And uh, Prabhat Patank, uh, Joyti Ghosh and I wrote a series of, of opinion pieces saying it's, you know, at the very least, we in the middle class are getting our salaries. Ensure that minimum wages are paid to every single family. We will calculate about 7,000 rupees and universal PDS. And we calculated it actually would not have cost more than 3% of GDP. And would have intense suffering, displacement, everything could have been avoided. The irony, of course, as you look back, is that if they had done it, we wouldn't have had the economic contraction that we, that we have. Uh, and, and I've always felt that humane response and, and uh, you know, the most ironical in this is, uh, and I'll just make two more points, I know I'm taking too much time, it contrast us with, uh, with Pakistan. Uh, and I've been to Pakistan a few times, it's one of the very poorly administered states. Uh, but it, it is, you know, when... Uh, and we have this very elite uh, president and playboy com compared to our very grassroots kind of prime minister. But when he was advised to go for a total lockdown like India, the word he used was, what will happen to my poor people? My poor people. They eat, earn and eat every day. If we have a total lo lo lockdown, they will starve. I cannot go for it. And... They didn't do very much else, but the mere fact that they did not go in for such a cruel lockdown uh, was enough to uh, ensure that today when we see their COVID performance is better, much better than India, their economic performance is much better than India, only because they showed elementary compassion. Uh, we have gone in for a growing privatized healthcare system and all of us who complained about it, don't worry about it, you know, uh, Poor people will be insured and they will get the best health care when they need it. They need it now. It's the century's greatest crisis. 80% of trained doctors work for the for-profit sector. 80%. The remaining 20%, only some of them became available. And the condition, I, when I got COVID, I insisted that I would only go to a public hospital and that to a, a general ward. It's something that almost killed me. Uh, it was so hellish, I can't tell you. Uh, it was so hellish, I found over time that none, and this is all India Institute, the monitors were not working. Um, I spoke to the staff and I found most of the staff were untrained because the regular trained staff refused to work there. No doctors ever came on duty. Uh, you know, the monitor, the monitor wasn't working at home, at least somebody was checking my oxygen. Uh, it was, and, and the people had homeless friends would tell me that if somebody died, luckily nobody died while we were there, but if somebody died, the whole you would pick up and if you complain too much, they'd say you pick up. And so the patients used to pick up the bodies and take them to the mortuary. And we cannot reduce uh, our 
poor people to this because we have the safety and it's very telling that when our union home minister gets covid or when chief ministers get covid they invariably check in to private hospitals i cannot think of anything any greater public immorality if you don't have faith in the public systems that you are responsible for then you might as well resign uh, no no we have to save our lives if 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 your hospitals cannot save uh, your lives and then how can they be saving other people's lives clearly those other lives don't matter the kind of hunger explosion that i saw on the streets and so from the second or third day i was on the streets i said i will defy any kind of curfew and my young friends and we finally we hadn't planned we finally distributed 10 million meals uh, uh across the country and it, it was it was still a small act of solidarity but the desperation i mean you know that uh, people would just fall over each other uh, somebody said something very ironical and everything is about modi ji because uh, that's how he's done it so they would say modi ji greed log mar jaye yahi chahte hain so i say kyun aap aise keh rahe hain to he said modi ji kehte hain ki aap bheed mein nahi nikliye ghar se bahar nahi nikliye lekin hamare paas khana nahi hai khana jo bat raha hai wo bahar nikal nikal ke hi milta hai aur jab koi baat raha hai then bheed hi ikattha hoti hai and we fall over each other so we are just you know out there to get infected uh, and the, if they really wanted why couldn't they come to each of our homes and give the food for instance uh, and, and so on so it's not as if poor people didn't see the 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 displacement of migrants is the largest distress movement of people in human history apart from the movement of slaves if that doesn't stir our conscience and i thought at the end of all of this at least this budget we had two announcements that we will have social security for all workers which really works uh, we will have uh, at last a proper public health system instead we demolished whatever little protections labor had and uh, and uh, 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 you know and and there's no addition in in public health uh, spending for improving the system and all of this is possible because of middle class people like you and me what our expectations are from our government we have somehow been convinced that the government is doing everything to protect us because we matter uh, and uh, and we are indifferent to what it's doing to the poor as it happens it's entirely illusory if they if the poor i'm working with homeless people as i said and i found that uh, they they just don't do testing among the among the homeless and i have been demanding it over and over again they don't want those numbers people are just dying quietly and uh, uh, no one cares uh, and then they said uh, I, uh, where can i take homeless people for quarantine so the the, uh, the health minister they announced that no no we have a policy of home quarantine now so okay what about people who don't have homes where you can quarantine they don't have an answer because and that's the large majority of people living in this city if i lim- living in a slum shanty and so on so so i think that uh, the x ray that this moment has shown us is of a, of one of, among the most uncaring cruel people uh, as the middle class and the rich uh, and unless we build the solidarity that you talked about and there were many acts of kindness by by middle class people and their organizations and if i have time again i'll speak about them uh, in my book i've talked about them as circles of kindness uh, it, it was extraordinary what i saw uh, on the other hand about what individual people reached out but if we were too small uh, and we didn't make those demands from our state uh, and i think that unless we have this new social contract where every life is of equal value Uh, and every one of us must be treated with the same dignity and respect uh, and none of us have escape paths the problem is that we in the middle class i i am i is of the sun in my childhood when we fell ill i don't remember ever going to a private hospital or clinic we would sit and wait outside in the dispensary like everybody else and those dispensaries were reasonably good once we middle class people exited uh, from government schools government hospitals uh, uh, they were they were left for the poor so services for the poor become very poor services and uh, and unless we restore uh, middle class stake and participation in 
in in in in public institutions of healthcare education uh, we we will allow yet another generation uh, to uh, to suffer to not get the minimum life opportunities i, I promise this will be the last point I, i'll make uh, Ravi Shivastav, one of our very fine labor economists, when we were seeing what happened to the migrants, he made a very important point. He said that, you know, we know these labor laws, social security, many things broke down. But something else broke down, which was the worst. And I said, what is it? And he said, it was trust. He said, workers knew they were being exploited. Uh, they knew uh, that uh, they were not getting a deal. But they had the trust that when a real crisis came, our employers and our uh, and the government will take care of us. What they found was when the real crisis hit us, they threw them to the wolves. And, and therefore they left in anguish. And now they're coming back without even that, that illusion. Uh, think of what they would be feeling. Now, I've spoken to some of them and they've said, they come back with, with deep, deep sadness. But they say in Bihar, in, 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 in UP, there is no work in Chhattisgarh. And I would have loved to spend the rest of my life with my family in, 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 you know, in these difficult times. But there's no work, there's no food in which father can see his child dying of hunger. So we are back. Uh, and they're back without even uh, you know, those last illusions that when the crisis really hits us, there will be people to care for us. Great, thank you for you know, really describing the, the level of breakdown in all parts of, of our system and to really think about the role of middle class. I want to come to you, Vidya, um, you know, to talk, did, did what Harsh spoke about resonate? I think we all saw and, and felt definitely that, but there were, there were things that you saw, right, as a result of the lockdown in terms of whether philanthropy or, or the private sector um, what's your take based on just hearing the extent of that that breakdown um, from from your perspective? And I just wanted us to, you know, talk about what's broken, but also like what has worked and, and of what's broken, what do we really, you know, just like Harsh said, we really need middle class to step in now and start caring about this. Your views on some of that as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Harsh mentioned at some point in our previous conversation that uh, one of the things that emerged is actually the poor actually really helped the poor in whatever capacity they could. And I also saw that with, uh, with the middle class. I also saw that with a lot of philanthropic organizations who very quickly, some of, some of us were really agile and really wanted to adapt. Uh, so if you also, uh, I mean, some of us may have also followed some of the fundraising that happened in the midst of COVID. And I know that there was a lot of attention that went on this, on, you know, on PM cares and what the state was raising. But we also saw many of the retail platforms raising incredible sums of very small money, you know. So this hadn't been this kind of retail fundraising where you know, people just got together and said that they would give whatever they had uh, is very, very clearly a sign, you know, that we saw with, uh, you know, during COVID. We hadn't seen this level of fundraising before. I also think that one of the constituencies that didn't get or has, still hasn't gotten as much credit for its response during COVID is actually civil society organizations. Because along with doctors and health workers and a number of others. It was civil society organizations, including organizations like Harsh's, who went into communities at great personal risk to distribute food rations, to figure out how to get access to medical health, to, to figure out how to get migrants back home, you know, to arrange transport to do, or, you know, there were, there were organizations that just organized for help in the midst of the, you know, the, the journeys that a lot of these people undertook. So while we have stories um, like Harsh's, you know, we also have stories of migrant workers who were deliberately shown the wrong path going home, 
and therefore underwent even more tribulation than they otherwise would have. Um, we also have stories of, of people who put uh, themselves to great personal risk and of organizations who, who really went beyond. I think philanthropy as a whole and corporations as a whole reacted, uh, some reacted in a very traditional way, but a lot of us also figured what were the best ways to adapt. And I think a lot of us made funding completely flexible in the midst of COVID and say, just use it wherever you think, you know, and, and here's, and we advanced disbursements we made the funding extremely flexible. We said we uh, we we waived out any report, waived off any reporting during the midst of cri the crisis, and we also, since there was an in a overwhelming international response as well, really facilitated a lot of that funding to go down to organizations which were at the front and center of uh, you know COVID response. And finally, I think there were organizations who were not. Um, built to respond to COVID. Like, for example, there were organizations like Ali that you also know very well, Neera, who really do work around access to legal justice. But even in the midst of that, they realized that rates of violence were going up and they actually tweaked their programs to go and go again into communities and find solutions. Like Harsh said, these are communities without space. You know, it's, it, it was an intense environment. And even then, there were organizations who figured, okay, this is what is required. And there were funders like us who said, okay, how do we enable this? Because unfortunately, we couldn't go out the way they, they could go out. So thanks, Vidya, for just sharing, you know, role of philanthropy, a lot more giving we, we saw accelerated at that time. So, you know, in the moment of crisis, perhaps some hope. I'd love to come back as it... What will make that sustainable, right? So I want to shift after we just hear from you, Shashir, just to a bit of, you know, really what are these lessons? And as I move to you, Shashir, just to pick up from where Vidya did speak, you know, kick off with, there was an important role that civil society, in fact, did play and step in. And I think all of us as civil society kind of wished the government appreciated that more because not only did we step in to be able to support this breakdown in, in public systems, we then got slammed with all these other regulations and CSR moving away. So, you know, despite all of that, I think I'd love to hear your perspective on what Vidya shared, a little bit of what Harsh shared. Also, there's an interesting question here for all of, all of us to think about, but Shashir, you can lean into this. Mudit, I can feel you, you're super active here. He's asked, as a proud Indian, I would like to outsource the government of India. Is it possible? I would like to be provocative that I think they do outsource to civil society. But, you know, what do you think, uh, Shashir, just building on some of what uh, Vidya and Harshab also said? I completely agree with what Vidya said. Uh, and there's nothing to disagree with what Harsh has said, except a couple of points here. Um, one, I'm looking at the same x-ray that uh, Arundhati Roy was looking at. And from that X-ray, I saw a different India as well. Please do realize that this was a crisis which was beyond anyone's comprehension. Uh, neither forget civil society, even the government uh, was unable to comprehend the magnitude of what was hitting them. And in that, what I see, and this is the only space I disagree with her, is that the middle class was not as indifferent as is seen please do realize that what we've seen is a huge tidal wave of civil society. And here I'm breaking this into two groups. One is the organized civil society, organizations, uh, nonprofits, which really came together. And this is remarkable. And the best part is COVID has been here for so long. Nonprofits don't generally work together in a sustained manner for a long time. But this crisis has brought a lot of nonprofits break down the silos and work together, uh, exchange ideas and ensure that the last mile delivery, the beneficiaries um, go home safely or have a meal at home. But there's a, another segment of civil society, which is people like you and me, the individuals, the middle class individual who really poured his heart out. A simple example, I talk about urban India. So I'm talking about this India right now and not that India, if I'm going to put it that way. But the urban India 
when we started our food program in mumbai and mumbai is a city which has a very large migrant population and with the crisis hit a lot of people were homeless a lot of people needed meals a lot of people wanted to go back home the number of people who put out money help food in all forms was countless and my heart goes out to and the respect to all these people now we might argue that this is not enough fair enough but this is a 100 million times more than what they were expected to do yes there is so much more we can do so point one i'm i'd like to emphasize is that civil society organizations as well as individuals really rose to the occasion and a lot of the inadequacies of the government uh, were kind of covered um, sheltered just because civil society really helped a lot uh, we didn't see an outrage but because we were so busy still coping and helping that the out, outrage element or the time was was far little uh, you ask me what is the learning so the learning i would still say that we still don't have a framework um, to respect this kind of a response that the civil society has given while we are not yet out of the crisis civil society continues to help um, a point which harsh mentioned about trust there is a huge trust deficit with the state and it's that trust deficit which continues which has led civil society to come forward so uh, cut a long story short um, we have a very strong civil society which needs to be built together as a framework that if in a crisis we have come together uh, then in a peace time can we sustain that togetherness uh, the amount of money that has been poured in by organizations like it edg midwives and so many other organizations uh, without questioning because they felt the need was so high at this point and by individuals uh, really helped bridge the gap between what the government should have done yes the government should have done so much more but i am not here right now uh, to say we are still going through a crisis the government should have learned so many lessons they have not but i think it's high time we also learn some of our lessons here neera no thanks to share and i'm just going to ask you a follow up question and then the same question vidya to you and then harsh for you just to respond to you know how all these stakeholders have or have not engaged i wanted to bring in the role of the private sector right so we've spoken about the state we've spoken about civil society but we haven't quite captured did the private sector play a role are there lessons from how you know they've engaged i know as you know from dasra's perspective we had a lot of the business leaders put their hand up and say wait a second we have informal workers that are migrants and are suffering in this way can we make our companies um more protective and include them and have safety nets and we created this thing called social compact and we're seeing a growing interest in it i think there's challenges there and there's time before this will actually solve but what's the what did you see the role of the private sector if any in the lockdown and then you know going forward shish your your thoughts and then i'll come to you vidya and then harsh for your overall perspective uh, you know the private sector is caught between the devil and the deep sea you yeah. know, it's here you you have employees or its workforce or people out the civil society which is suffering it may want to help and here there is also a governance system which does not let you live in peace let's be real about it so uh, what i think vidya pointed out uh, about the pm care fund and so many challenges that the private sector was compelled to maybe uh, provide support to that fund which could have otherwise come directly to through so many other csr opportunities to people so i would question the private sector had it been a far more um, healthier ecosystem around there was so much better things that could have been done but i still feel a lot has happened people there would be black sheep everywhere but despite that there's a lot that did happen in the positive sense i somebody who looks at a glass half full so i really appreciate the way the private sector did did step in yeah go ahead vidya yeah i i think you know there is a distinction here between formal and informal work and therefore you know usually private sector tends to get associated more with the organized or the formal workforce which is actually you know under 10% of the total uh, you know employment in the country 
So I think the, the and the organized sector also has uh, regulation that you know for various reasons companies uh, follow or are forced to follow. And so I think in that sense, the protection of the workforce, which is just around 10%, was more or less a given. Most companies did not lay off people, at least during the lockdown. Most companies provided for facilities to work from home. But we're really talking about the 90%, you know, who were left high and dry. And, you know, there are, there's enough surveys that have recently come out, for example, the CMI report on female labor force participation rates, which has fallen again. The last time it fell, you know, precipitously was in 2016 after Demon. And now after the lockdown, we find that it's again, you know, fallen to something like 9% in urban India, which is just so shameful. And I think if you look at the informal workforce i think it was kind of got uh, you know a bashing on both cheeks in one sense because one came from the lockdown itself and the way employers in the informal sector reacted to that and effectively people were just left to their own devices like harsh described and the other was the labor laws you know which i think the timing was really really poor because it came in the midst of something, a structural reform of that nature in the midst of a crisis is never a good idea. And so I think the most of the distress that we saw, and we saw so many moving images of that, was all around the informal sector. And there are, there are deep structural issues, whether it comes to female labor force participation rates or even the men's labor, fo labor force participation rates. We are not sufficiently industrialized. We are not sufficiently regulated. And in fact, under the guise of uh, reform, you know, we're going back to reducing uh, the, you know, what should actually be available in terms of social security and other such mechanisms. So therefore, I think we have to define what, what we mean by private sector. And for me, I would worry more about employers of informal labor and figuring out what are the structural things we need to do because these structural things are so deep that COVID exposed them. We'll have another crisis and the, you know, of, of any other nature and there will be a whiplash of a similar sort again, you know. So COVID was an excuse for us to be able to look in the mirror and say, this does not work. You know, it's just... It's so much of humanity in India going through such a terrible time. It's just not a good thing. If, and if there are structural reasons that we need to think about, we have to do that quickly and we should do it now, you know, because another crisis will hit and we'll have the same situation. No, thanks. Yeah, um, thank you. Harsh, your thoughts? You're on mute. Harsh, you're on mute. I said, firstly, with great respect, I'll have to disagree a lot with some of the things that Shishir said. Uh, you know, I think that the private sector uh, let us down very badly. Uh, I think that, uh, and if we don't recognize it now, uh, uh, we will never uh, resolve it. I have been teaching a course at IIM Ahmedabad uh, for about 12 years uh, uh, on poverty and governance and so on. And I tell the students who, very, who are very sensitive and uh, who listen very hard that, you know, when, when, when they ask, what is your expectations from the private sector? I said, actually, I don't want your CSR charity. Don't write checks of charity. Do just three things. Pay your labor what is truly their due. Pay the taxes that you're meant to pay with, without evading any of them. And don't destroy the environment. That's what I expect from you. Uh, and if you don't do all of these three things and you write a few checks, uh, it, it's like adding insult to injury. Uh, you talk about companies, you know, the data says it itself. Uh, formal, decent, what ILO calls decent work has actually significantly precipitously fallen through all the uh, period of high economic growth and economic liberalization which means that 
the private sector is increasingly going in for contract, subcontract, sub subcontract. And so, as Vidya said, your direct employers will take care of. But the large mass of, of, of the workers, uh, you created an environment, the government has allowed you to create an environment where you are completely irresponsible for them. So I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I do think that, uh, uh, the second is that about learning lessons. Uh, I was just reading 1894, we had the Bombay plague. And the colonial administrators wrote about how we can prevent it in future. And uh, there was a wonderful remark that, that he wrote. He said that there are only two things that can prevent this in the future to ensure every resident of the city has two things which are completely free. One is clean air and the other is clean water. And he, he, he talked about how important it was to build a city which, where people are not crowded into shanties and so on. We didn't do it and we know what Dharavi is and all of that. And, and my fear is that, you know, we will just pass on and, you know, uh, I thought we'd take a little time and pretend for a little while that we really feel badly and we'll do some reforms uh, for the poor. But we're living in times where you don't even need to make those uh, those kinds of, you know, that we will have a pro proper public health system at last, we'll increase labor, social security and so on. Thirdly, uh, you know, about philanthropy filling in, I, the philanthropy must supplement what is my right as in the state. I, 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 it cannot, you cannot have the state, as the Prime Minister often did, uh, you know, appealing to charity. Uh, you know, just, just as an exercise, if all of us in the middle class had been told, all your salaries are going to stop through all of this period. You know, uh, none of you will access, have access to private hospitals. And, and you would still be not nearly uh, where the poor are, very, very far from it. Uh, but then would you applaud uh, these policies and wait for charity? Uh, if you had to wake up every morning, uh, and I've seen this, uh, Shishir, every morning you have to wake up uh, and sit and uh, stand in line for three hours so that, that you get one plop of uh, kichri. Uh, and for people who have never had put their hands out to eat, uh, to to be fed, and then you rest for, and then you're in, 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 in this hot sun, and then you come back, and then you have to sit, stand for another three hours so that you get another plop of kichri. We cannot reduce our people to this. Uh, the government, I, I had filed a petition in the Supreme Court, in the Chief Justice's Court, uh, just to say that give a minimum wage and give uh, universal rations. Uh, the government falsely said, no, no, we are ensuring food to every single person. So the, the Honorable Chief Justice actually said this in court. He said, the government is saying everybody has got food. So we have to do nothing. And why should they have need cash if, you, if they're getting food? And I really wanted to say this, and I've said it publicly in a number of places, Honorable Chief Justice, if that is how you look at people, I undertake to send you a very nice uh, Russian tiffin carrier of the best breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You should not get a salary. You know, poor people are not some other species very different from any of us, but we allowed that to happen. Uh, but the last thing, I mean, well, while saying all of this, we get hope that we are not still destroyed as a society by those acts of spontaneous acts of, of, of kindness. Uh, firstly, about the middle class itself, I mean, I like when the migrants were walking, I would stand and, uh, and just see car after car after car of anonymous people stuffed with water uh, and food and water pouches, etc. And they'd quietly hand it over to migrants and drive away and then come back and then other people would come back. It showed our humanity still somehow existed. Nobody knew their names. Nobody got any publicity, etc. Uh, but even more than that, I would find what the poor people did to poor people. And let me just say one or two lines of this. Uh, as I work with homeless people, I mean, I would talk to them, how are you surviving? So I remember this homeless man saying, um, you know, I had just a little money saved over, so I'm buying food. But I'm alone in the world, but I can't just eat myself. This family next to me, they're two small children. Can you imagine that I would eat and not ensure food for them? So whatever money I have, I'm feeding them and I'm feeding myself.
And when it finishes, then we'll see. Uh, you know, how many of us would do that? Really, I'm, uh, you know, uh, in, in this time of crisis. Uh, and, and 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 there were many such examples. Uh, one that I love uh, a lot is about a a Muslim, very poor laborer whose son was disabled. And he desperately had to get him back to the village a few hundred kilometers away. And when he had felt he had no other option, he stole a bicycle from a Hindu man. And he left a letter saying, uh, I'm, I, I, you know, I have really caused you wrong. I have stolen your bicycle. Uh, but this is the reason uh, I have a disabled child and I had to take him home. But I'm really very, very sorry. And uh, the Hindu uh, owner of the bicycle read it and then decided that he wouldn't even file a complaint in the police station that his bicycle was stolen. It is those bonds of solidarity, I think, that give us uh, not charity, uh, not even philanthropy, uh, a, a new social contract that Neera spoke about, I think, where each of us have equal rights. If you and I have social security, Everybody should have social security. If you and I can work from, you know, home, yeah, the public health systems which work for all. So one part of the social contract and the idea of solidarity that I will not be able to sleep at night if I know that children outside are, are, are sleeping. No, thanks, Harsh. I want to. I want us to force ourselves to shift a bit to, you know from from what has not worked or sparks of what has worked how do we create more of of what has worked right so shishir back to you i'm going to give you some time to to speak to to respond but also you did highlight right it, it did you know some did come together so civil society did work so if we are going to look ahead think about ref, reform think about activities or things that can build momentum for you know <laughs> A critical mass to engage in ways that we we need to have for this to you know be solved per se what's your perspective on on that yeah just to uh, quickly respond to what harsh has said that while i'm appreciating what civil society has done that does not mean that i'm not condoning uh, i'm not uh, kind of uh, criticizing what the government if i if on a scale of one to ten they were zero but to a very large extent on areas that they were expected to perform you know, so there are so many horror stories that one can come out with in the way the government should have, which they have not. And I'm not even walking that road right now because Harsh has so rightly pointed so many areas and, and so has Vidya. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, let us also appreciate the acts of kindness which have happened. Uh, let us also understand the kind of system that we live in. Um, and I'm not saying that this is how we are, so this is what we can do. But the, the number of positive stories that came out um, in the same civil society which lives under the same set of challenges did go out. I'll give you one simple example. Mumbai is not a very easy city to live in. And uh, we created Meals Project Mumbai, which is a, which is a very young organization. We are two year old. We were 13 month old when the pandemic hit. And, we, uh, through a citizen-led movement called Khana Chahiye, we helped uh, feed 75 lakh people um, over over six months. But a simple example I could give it, I've narrated that in the past, that how people do help out. The pandemic meant each of us was supposed to be at home because we were fearful of the, of the virus. And yet, when there was one person who needed medicines for a chemotherapy uh, in Mumbai, he put it out on our citizen-led group to say, I need this medicine. Uh, three different hands from three different geographies of Mumbai went out and said, I'll pick up the medicine from one area, travel another 15 uh, kilometers. A second volunteer picked it up, took it another 10 kilometers, and a third volunteer picked it up. And stories like these are not just from Mumbai, but from different parts of India which come out. Uh, yes, this is from an urban pocket, but they're from non-urban pockets as well. Uh, so there are positives that have emerged out of it. What we need to do is to institutionalize these processes now uh, to uh, provide the respect that the civil society deserves to create a proper framework uh, within the system uh, at one part. Second, uh, yes, 
there are so many areas where we can criticize the government, but there are also some good people within the government. Uh, can we look at dealing with those people and trying to make them see some reason? There is a huge amount of strength which uh, the private sector has is in fast decision making. There is a fantastic ability that the government has, which may it can be used in scaling up um, something as simple as what, what's happening right now, vaccination. Uh, there's so much better things that the government could have done. Uh, they could have brought in, uh, lowered down the age of from, from 60 to 45, maybe a month ago, and we could have been so much in a better position. But that kind of a synergy is what the government should have learned uh, in the last 12 months, which it is not. And there are positives, and that's where I feel a private sector can play a far more important role. Civil society, which are individuals, can play a far bigger role if this framework is put in place and institutionalized. Nira. Yeah, no, th th thanks, Shashir. Um, you know, just for sharing what we might need to think about is how do we institutionalize a little more? And I'm going to come to Vidya with you. There's two questions in the chat from uh, Ajit. Hi, Ajit. It's nice to hear from you. Um, and then I'll come to you, Harsh, um, for, for a follow-up question. But Vidya, there's, you know, Ajit's written here, great conversation, poor helping poor, ordinary citizens helping each other, all individual acts of kindness. But here we go. How can we, with our data collecting, analyzing strengths, harness and formalize this compassion, assist those ordinary citizens, help each other? And the follow-up question, how do we, the fortunate, help those helping others rather than coming up with new formal organizations? So two pieces to this, you know, can the data actually help us engage and, and why do we keep all creating, you know, new things? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think um, what has emerged over not just COVID, but I, you know, we have a couple of floods a year. It, it sounds so horrible to say this, but we seem to have disasters strike us almost every year. COVID, of course, has been of an entirely different magnitude. But I think for every crisis, we have seen people come together in some form or fashion. And there are great organizations out there who mobilize. You know, Dastra does a lot of work. Give India does a lot of work. Boonj does a lot of work. We have, we have that. So I'm actually never so much worried about individual kindnesses because and and also social media social media can amplify things it can collect we have mechanisms you know you don't have to move out of your house to donate i think it's all there my worry is not so much about that it's in a, in a sense it's what hush has been saying you cannot re rely on individual kindnesses and how do you how do you work structurally with government systems to ensure that the um, you know that what government needs to do uh, you we can nudge we can push we can facilitate but we cannot replace so for example when the 2000 rupees per woman or some such was was declared we we found in a lot of our communities that the cost for the woman to go to the bank exceeded 2000 rupees because it would take her a whole day to go there and come back. These are not, you know, we have to find other mechanisms. And in the midst of a crisis, we need to see how can we engage either with civil society, society organizations, or how do we strengthen district administration and taluka and uh, block level administration to enable, you know, these things to happen. So whether when the PDS system broke down in a lot of places, it was NGOs who actually used philanthropic money to go and buy food grain from Food Corporation of India Godowns to go and distribute, right? So this, so therefore I'm, you know, the question around indiv individual kindness is a good one, but I'm always less worried about it. Yeah, no, thank you. And I want to just build from there and Harsh come, come, come to you where, you know, we're often working in civil society trying to say if there's data and we can perhaps make the invisible more visible and then will there be more action. That isn't always the case. And so what's your take on that? But also, I'm a bit concerned when we all start speaking about the government as separate from the people. And there is a question here that is the government not representing the people and didn't we vote for them in the first place? So they're not this beast separate of civil society and separate of the private sector, but in fact, make up all of us. Um, you know, just some thoughts on both of these from the questions that we have. 
No, yeah, completely. I, I, I am not one to say the problem is out there. I, I see that, as they say, one finger is there, the three fingers pointing at us. We, we have chosen uh, the government we have. We have endorsed its policies over and over again. And these are policies that have excluded, and, and the data is very strongly available. Uh, Nira, there's no, it is not true that data is not available. Uh, it reached a point when there's virtually no job creation and decent work job creation for the last several years. So the government responds by not publishing this data or not collecting this data, not, uh, not by you know, having a debate that, yes, uh, structural adjustment policies has increased wealth, but it is not creating jobs. And, and the central argument was that because it, it let it create, let uh, uh, Adani get 500 times richer and Ambani, I don't know how many times richer, how does it trouble you? Because all of you will be better because you'll have decent work opportunities. Uh, why do you need a pu pu public health system when you'll have enough money to buy the health care you want? These are the arguments we've heard over 30 years. Let us at least be honest. In fact, the IMF itself, the IMF president, the World Bank, is saying now clearly that we were wrong about public health. Uh, we were wrong about uh, saying that the private sector should, should, should be allowed to replace the public sector in health and education because it will intrinsically exclude the poor. Uh, the last World Development Report actually also said for the first time it admitted that job creation is not happening. Uh, I, I can give you the data. I've written about it extensively. Uh, it is not that data isn't there. It is the data that we are refusing to look at its implications. And, uh, you know, this, uh, when I was growing up in college, there was a book that we all uh, was, you know, like to read and quote, uh, which is uh, Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. The subtitle was Economics as if People Matter. Uh, and, and I love that because, you know, you might have, have had high economic growth, but if people have not, you know, people's own lives what is the difference between, you know, we are told China and India are virtually comparable in their inequality. It is true, but Amartya Sen points out that the penalty of being the bottom 10% in India is much higher than the penalty of being at the bottom 10% of, of, of China. Because if I'm still in that bottom 10% when my child falls sick, she has access, I have access to a decent public hospital, free of charge, I can send her to a decent school, there is some nutrition, etc., available. We haven't built the public systems. And I, I was part of the National Advisory Council. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh was deeply committed to market uh, economics. I say that, you know, we can have a discussion about it, but let us have this social contract of agreeing that at this level, let us accept that there's a floor of human dignity below which no one should be allowed to fall. No child should sleep hungry. We still have every third child today mandarished, which literally means that their brains and bodies are not being allowed to form to full potential. When we have 100 million tons sometimes of grain and uh, in our government warehouses, uh, it may not make sense to you, but it means that if you put those sacks of grain in a line, you can go from the earth to the moon, come back, go down the earth so many times. We're not using that and malnourishment continues. Surely we must accept that there's something wrong. We haven't built, there's virtually no public health, uh, primary health care systems in, 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 in most, of, most of the country. I was chairing a committee which was looking at this. And we had recommended a set that just build a strong public uh, primary health care system for urban India. And I was reading that report again and with, with other friends who were part of it. And if they'd done that, so many lives, I mean, that would have been for every 50,000 people, you have a functioning primary health care system, which is free. Uh, you could go there, you know, uh, many things would have happened. So I feel that let us not be in denial. Let us say that we can have a debate about market economics and we can have different views, but let us admit that A, it's not created jobs, B, uh, you know, access to healthcare, etc. 80% of work uh, doctors work for the for profit. It has not provided more than 10% of the COVID response, and most of that has been at extortionist prices. Uh, and 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 we have to admit that. So it was a lie to tell us we'd be safe uh, with this great private sector. You and I are safe. 
I chose not to go there, so I almost died. But uh, uh, but that is that is not the country. Is that the country we want to build? So let us not let us not cover up. Uh, and it is not this government or the last or the one that went, went before it that is responsible. It is because we people of middle class and, and rich people influence the government, and we have not even now in this huge crisis displayed sustained empathy. Uh, with what it means to still not be able to find work uh, and food for your children. Thanks, Harsh. I just wanted to pick up on the uh, sustained empathy and come to you, actually, Vidya, where, you, you know, there's been a lot of wealth despite COVID, the pandemic, you know, <laughs> the private sector, and the wealth has increased, whether in markets or, you know, actual businesses. Do you see that translating perhaps into more philanthropy? Do you, are you hopeful of that? Do you, you know, share a bit more the role of philanthropy and how it is engaging with the government. And let's also say there's parts of government that doesn't work. There's parts of government we've seen actually work with civil society, right? There's the political side of the bureaucracy and there's sort of to India's in the government as, as well. But some your thoughts on that? No, I, I, I think, yes, you know, we've, we've seen so much more new wealth being created. Uh, and uh, it's sometimes quite weird for me to, uh, to see that how a large part of the country has suffered so much and there is still a small percentage of the country that continues to prosper. Um, uh, my hope is that, especially when it is younger entrepreneurs and a newer wealth, we are seeing a trend, and I'm sure you do a lot of work um, with, uh, you know, uh, families, the new gen, um, and you're seeing a very, very different mindset. Uh, and therefore, I'm very, very hopeful that we will see new models of philanthropy, we will see new models of engagement. Uh, perhaps they will apply more of a systems lens so that you build on or at least nudge and improve government capacity to deliver what it needs to deliver. And you're also very right about how there are pockets of government uh, which really uh, respond quite uh, beautifully, actually, to certain, you know, you know sort of uh, wicked challenges which have entrenched themselves far too long, especially around education, uh, you know, where we, we've personally seen a very forward-looking department that has constantly encouraged, nudged, pushed us into really uh, uh, delivering, you know, together the mandate of uh, improved learning in children. But I think my, my worry continues that, and there's again recent data which has very clearly shown that our savings rate, which is to be about 30 odd percent, has dipped to just about 10%, which means a large part of India lived out of its savings. Um, and that is that part of India that could that could save, right? So even that part of India has had to dip into savings to just survive this last year because there have been, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, job losses and everything else. So I think overall, the trend is, uh, you know, that... Hopefully, as new and more wealth gets created, and there are uh, there is a new theory of philanthropy that emerges that encourages more learning and sharing and collaboration. There will be a more effective way of engaging both with civil society and with government. Shishir, you agree with Vidya that that it is moving in this direction, and um, there's also a question here that you know, how can the average citizen bring systemic change in the government? Because I know you talk quite a lot about being community-led and citizen-led. So a little bit of your views on can the citizen engage in systems change? I know Vidya talked a bit about the role of philanthropy to support organizations with engaging with the government. But what's your take on that? And I believe that there is a fairly large, younger next generation, which is far more conscientious and conscious about uh, their commitment towards society. It's a far more caring next generation that we are seeing. Uh, having said that, that is not enough. What we need to have is a much more participative democratic role that the next generation should be playing. Uh, 
this is the time that the outrage that we were talking about in the first part of the discussion needs to come out far more openly now. Uh, we are we get to see a few murmurs here and there, but it's important that to bring in some kind of systemic change. Uh, it's not just that I continue doing what I'm doing to help others, but at the same time, I should start questioning those people in power as well, because uh, the trust deficit definitely is, is extremely weak, but that needs to be strengthened, that needs to be reinforced, and people need to start questioning. We do have a very large younger generation which is committed. Uh, philanthropy is giving them an opportunity to, to work, which is why we're seeing a lot of work as one says, the urban middle class moving towards um, the social sector, even when they're in the private space, they are committing their time to do something for others. But we need to also have a sense of outrage to the wrongs that are going on now. To, to, to that, Harsh, what Shish, you're saying, outrage, how to, how to channel that? Because we do it again, you know, our small acts of kindness, then we do, you know, small moments of outrage. There's also a lot of fear embedded in, in this. I wanna just shift us for the last few minutes that we have on right. What should we be doing? What are your recommendations? What should we have done? I think we spent a lot of time on what we you know, could have done and didn't work and it's all broken, but I wanna just leave us all with, you know, how do we look from the back, but really look forward and how do we act upon our outrage and overcome our fear in a collective way for real change? And I'd love to hear from you, Harsh. And same question, I'll come come to you, Vidyan, back to Shishir. Well, that's a wonderful uh, point at which to close this discussion. Uh, I don't believe that these are problems without solutions. But we must recognize that we have brought our democracy to a point where our freedoms are getting reduced each, you know, each day. Uh, I have seen, I, I was a member, I mean, I was in the administrative service, uh, even as, as a district magistrate, I would refuse to do, I would publicly disagree, and it was possible to do that, uh, and, uh, and so on. I was a member of the National Advisory Council, which was part of the Prime Minister's office, and in every second or third column, I would be critical of uh, the Prime Minister, and it was possible to do that. Uh, you know, it looks like it's some hoary sort of uh, sepia memories. Uh, we cannot let Democracy, at the heart of democracy, is the freedom of dissent. And some of the dissent can be justified, some of it cannot, may not be justified. But they have created, I mean, now the media is no longer the, uh, you know, has been completely tamed. Uh, parliament, the so-called opposition parties, uh, their various methods by which they have been silenced. Uh, that we have organizations like NHRC, etc., we've even forgotten. Uh, and now, uh, I think the last and universities, uh, all institutions are, are, are being brought into. Everybody has to endorse the line of the government. And uh, even when it is deviating from the core of the constitution, the idea of equal citizenship for all and so on. Now, I'm not getting into a debate whether that is right or wrong, but the debate itself is very important and legitimate. And if that debate is going to be not just crushed, but actually criminalized. So I have now such a rich CV over the last two, two, two years in terms from what, from what this government has done. Uh, I'm charged with insurrection. I'm charged with terror. I'm charged with hate mongering because I was part of the anti-CA protest because I worked with the, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to reach out to the students in Jamia and so on. And this is serious in charge sheets, in affidavits to the Supreme Court and the High Court. The expectation is, was that I would get silenced. I said the only way I can resist is to continue to speak out, which I've continued to do. I've not allowed uh, you know, the idea that I can be arrested for the rest of my life. Then they've started action against our institutions, our, the children's homes that I'm associated with, etc. I'm not going to bore you all. But I have realized that nothing they will, be, will be stopped at if you are seen as somebody dissenting with. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'd just like to remind you that when something similar, the Great Depression happened and President Roosevelt called in the unionists and they worked out what was called the New Deal. 
he said something wonderful when they were leaving. He said, now we've discussed it. You go out and it's your job to make sure that we do our duty. So he was telling them, agitate, uh, you know, hold us accountable. Uh, that's how democracies work. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, I think that we have to, we have to rebuild and re-strengthen our democracy, uh, the right to dissent. We're not having a debate here about whether Hindu Rashtra is better than what was promised in our constitution. By all means, that, let's have a debate around it, but don't suppress and criminalize voices that dissent. Uh, while we do this, these acts of individual sol solidarity are extremely important. I'm still able to hope because of the kindness that I see. And, you know, um, I, I, I remember, I mean, there's many things. But when I decided from the second day that I'd be on the streets, I thought I wouldn't ask any of my colleagues that they had to come. But, uh, you know, a growing number came. Many of them had to leave their homes and were living in the office. And I remember asking them at that time, the fear was, hey, hi, aren't you frightened of, uh, of, of getting COVID? And they said, Dar to hai. I, we are frightened. But much greater than my fear uh, is their hunger. And therefore, I must be on the streets. It is that sense of humanity uh, that we have to hold on to. But it is that sense of humanity that is not enough by substituting the failures of the state but by also demanding uh, if there were enough, enough of us. I said, even you know, if the Vande Bharat people coming from abroad said, you're getting us back, what about the migrants? Uh, the students coming back, what about you're getting us you know, safe, what about the migrants? We, I don't, I've been looking hard for one example uh, where you say, and Gandhiji taught us you know, civil disobedience is is meaningful only when you take a cost upon yourself. So I will continue to sit in quota, lonely and alone. My parents will be unhappy, but I will not use your facilities till you start providing them for your workers. It is those acts of solidarity. What do we need to do? We need to care enough uh, for the pain of which we will never suffer. None of us know what it means, involuntary hunger means. None of us know what it means to not be able to feed your children. Let us try to empathize with it and say that no more. That's great. Thank you, Harsh. So collective acts of solidarity. Vidya, closing thoughts from you, you please. And then Shishir, I'll come to you. I think for, you know, I, I from, from my perspective, because, you know, I, I uh, I, I can only come from the perspective of philanthropy and, you know, how we can make it more effective, especially in crises like this. And I think I go back to the issues of uh, the structural inequalities and uh, you know, the questions of structural inequalities have therefore to be um, dealt with. And if, 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 if they need to be dealt with by philanthropy, I think they, we will have to either strengthen our institutions or you and or get philanthropy to really consider institution building as a core part uh, of you know how they deliver the their philanthropy as opposed to only focusing on aiding or directing service delivery kind of work um, and and I go back to the U.S. example I think Harsh also alluded to what Roosevelt did but. Um, you know, if you look at uh, a lot of the institutions that got built in the United States, it was almost entirely on the back of philanthropy. And you can call them robber barons or whatever else you want to call them. It was the Rockefellers who built the University of Chicago and a whole host of academic institutions. It was the Fords and the uh, Carnegie's who built a whole host of them. Institutions, you know, right from institutions that today even government relies on, like you know the National Labor Statistics Bureau, or and that's why you have such great jobs-related data out there in the U.S. So, I think there is a call to action here that if we want to work around structural issues, philanthropy will have to do more than just uh, focus on supporting schools and you know uh, and looking at the health of its or or, or you know aiding you know in, in, in health delivery and I think that is where the shift will have to come from and I, I am hopeful only because I feel 
that this new young generation of new philanthropy that we're seeing, the next gen, uh, is thinking differently, uh, is not just necessarily into the old form of philanthropy, but is really trying to test the boundaries and say, okay, what do we do next? Build great institutions. And if you saw what's happened in the US over the last <laughs> five, six years, the institutions got really got knocked about, but they did not crumble. And I think that itself is testament to what we can do if we focus on institution building at a structural level. Great, thank you, Vidya. I'm coming to you, Shashir, and then we'll wrap up. Oh, you're on mute, Shashir. Sorry, uh, I'd not take too long, just to uh, emphasize one point. The, the need for of today is to have more solid public-private people partnership. Uh, what each of the other uh, panelists have spoken about, Vidya and her, there are uh, good people within the government. The private sector is rich with experience. Those two uh, institutions need to come together to come to come with some solutions. And then civil society, which is which is strong as institutions as well as individuals, there is a need to build a sense of ownership uh, within the society to the things that they are doing. And that's when there'll, there'll be a far more stronger voice. But the need would be to have uh, a model of PPP in every critical space. So then there's also, that builds a sense of accountability for the government in a lot of ways. Uh, the speed can be gotten by, by the private sector, built to a certain extent of experience. But finally, it has to be driven also by civil society, uh, which is really, very strong. They need to start learning to own, uh, own their cities as well. Yeah. Great, thank you, Shashir. So I'll just I'll just remind everybody. I think I might have added another P to your P, Shashir, but it's you know public-private people partnerships. Uh, I think is what you're leaving us with. And Vidya left us with let's tackle structural inequalities by building greater and stronger institutions. And then finally, Harsh left us with we need collective acts of solidarity to really have the change that we need to see. Uh, I'm going to leave you all with uh, a quote, again, from the book that I've been quite moved by called Cast. Uh, and again, as I had opened with that, you know, we are all people of privilege that are listening in. Uh, and we are one part of that India. And, and this is a quote she wrote that um, I'll just repeat. The price of privilege is the moral duty to act when one sees another person treated unfairly. And the least that a person in the dominant caste can do is make the, not make the pain any worse. So with that in mind, there's another quote from her book. Um, so there's something for us in this state of privilege, not just to make the pain worse, but to act upon making it better. And then she goes on to say, and the reason that I'm focusing a bit on caste is to really look at our role in privilege and really rewriting this social contract that the pandemic has opened up. And so this is the last thought I want to leave you with, which is caste is, in, is insidious, subtle, another word for subtle, and therefore powerful because it is not hatred. It is not necessarily personal. It is the worn grooves of comforting routines and unthinking expectations, patterns of a social order that have been in place for so long that it looks like it's the natural order of things. And so I hope I leave you with a bit of a prickly feeling that what we must break down the natural order of things, but not with the pandemic, but with coming together. So thanks all, thank you all three of you for your wisdom, your perspective and sharing what I know time is very precious. Thank you all of you for listening in and thank you Asia Society for bringing us all together in solidarity. And with that, have a great rest of the evening or wherever you might be in the world. <laughs>